Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cracking Addiction with Philippe and Naren and Fergal Armstrong. In this episode, we're going to be starting a multi-episode arc on cannabis and cannabis use disorder. But we're going to start off with some basics, first of all, and try and set aside some definitions and some terminology so we can help guide you, the listener and viewer, in future episodes about what we're talking about and how cannabis works on the body. So, Fergal, I've got a couple of questions for you. And first of all, the question I've got to ask is, what is the endocannabinoid system? And can you talk to us a bit about the receptors involved in the endocannabinoid system? Well, that's a huge question, <laughs> but we'll give it a go. Yes. Uh, so really, um, until a few years ago, we didn't really actually think that cannabis had uh, a receptor. We didn't really understand how cannabis made you high. And, you know, there were theories about the physical chemical properties of cannabis making you high. And really, it wasn't until we discovered anandamide that we realized then that there was an endocannabinoid receptor system. So, for, so really, it was, the, it was the discovery of anandamide that really opened up the entire industry for modulating the, the receptor system upon which cannabis has its effects. And interestingly enough, anandamide is derived from the Sanskrit for anand, which means blissful peace or something like that. Philippe, would you correct me? What, what does it exactly mean? Do you know? Look, I'd, I'd be going back to my, my Hindu <laughs> uh, Sunday school lessons or yeah. the equivalent of that, but I think uh, roughly that is that is exactly what yeah. it means. Yeah, I, I, it was, yeah it, it's called anandamide, I suppose, because they're trying, the, the original uh, nomenclature was trying to refer back to the fact that really when you smoke a joint and you get high, you're full of peace. Yeah, It calms people down. So... So really, the, the, the discovery of anandamide opened up the, the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. And it's fundamentally predicated on the presence of two receptors, CB1 and CB2. So the cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2. Now, cannabinoid receptor 1 was first discovered. And then later on, it was discovered there was actually a second uh, CB2 receptor. They both are G protein coupled receptors. They both either uh, stimulate guanylate, or sorry, they inhibit guanylate cyclase, or they decrease cyclic AMP, or they activate mitogen active protein kinase. But fundamentally, think of them as inhibitory. In the way basically opioid receptors are inhibitory, so too are the, uh, the, the, the effects of the cannabinoid receptor CB1, CB2. Now, where, or let's just talk about the site of disc or the site of action of these receptors, first of all. So we know that the CB1 receptor is basically found in the nervous system. If you forget everything else, CB1 is found in the peripheral and central nervous system. So where exactly does that mean? So it means particularly it's in the distal uh, ends of primary afferent neurons. It's in the dorsal horn, it's in the periaqueductal, the periaqueductal gray matter, and it's in the, the ventropostural lateral thalamus. It's also in cortical areas associated with central pain processing, including the anterior cingulate gyrus, the amygdala, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. So it's dotted around, around various parts of the nervous system which happen to also deal with either the peripheral or central appreciation and modulation of pain. So that's a useful segue potentially down the track into, into why we use cannabis for pain. Now, interestingly enough, the CB1 receptor is not found in the parabrachial nuclei, which is another part of the brain that deals with respiratory depression. So the CB1 receptor is not associated with, C, with uh, respiratory depression in the same way that uh, opioid receptors are. So we know that one of the side effects of opioids is respiratory depression. It's not really the case for the CB1 receptor and any drug or molecule that acts via the CB1 receptor. If we move to the CBT, sorry, the CB2 receptor, it was discovered later on 
And fundamentally, it was originally discovered in splenic macrophages, but then was found to basically be present in in flat or in tissue associated with the immune system. So it was found in the spleen, in tonsils, in the thymus, and, and also later on found in bone, gut, and liver. But fundamentally, think of the CB2 receptor as involved in the inflammatory response. So we've got the CB1 receptor involved in neurological function, and we've got the CB2 receptor involved in anti-inflammatory action. So I've discussed the sites of those receptors. Now let's talk about the function of those receptors. Now, Philippe, have you got any ideas as to, you know, what these receptors do in terms of function in the body? Classically, I guess the CB1 receptors affect thinking, coordination, motor function, appetite, memory, pain perception and immune function. And I guess that goes back to what you were saying earlier, Fergal, about, about the location and where, where, they, where they're found. And that, I guess, mm. helps mediate the action. So those are classically what the CB1 receptor is, is known for. The mm. CB2 receptor function, again, it's on multiple sites. And as you've already kind of alluded to, CB2 receptor function is, again, geared towards that anti-inflammatory effect it can affect immune function as well, helps release cytokine release and can downregulate mast cell uh, function as well. And it also helps modulate nerve growth factor also. Again, I guess the way I like to think of these things as well is, and it makes logical sense, you've kind of expertly alluded to where these receptors are found and where the, the difference between the locations of the CB1 and CB2 receptors and thus, one would expect them to take effect on where they're located. So thus, yeah. one can see that th there is a difference in between how those receptors function and act. Yeah. So really, we're seeing structure demonstrating function, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Fergal, so could you talk system. to us? Absolutely. And Fergal, could you talk to us a bit more about some of the, um, the indigenous ligands associated in this system? Yeah. So... So remember I said that the entire endocannabinoid system was revealed by the discovery of the first endogenous ligand, which was enandamide. Now, the other, the synonym for enandamide is, is uh, AEA. So it's arachidinyl ethanol amide. And it was the, uh, the first endocannabinoid endogenous ligand discovered. It is a partial agonist of CB1, but it's also a full agonist of the transient receptor potential valinoid receptor type 1. And that's more to do with uh, uh, free nerve endings and pain sensitivity, which again alludes to function, doesn't it? So the, the, the first uh, endogenous ligand was anandam anandamide. The second one was 2-AG, which is 2-arachidonyl glycerol. And it is a full agonist of CB1. Now, both of these ligands are actually synthesized in postsynaptic neurons in the, in the postsynaptic membrane. So basically, they're, they're synthesized on demand on site from the membrane. So literally, an enzyme comes along and clips off a little bit of the membrane. And then the membrane is, is processed. And then from those processes, out comes these endogenous ligands. And then once those endogenous ligands are produced, remember they're all derived from lipid soluble precursors and they're still lipid soluble and literally they just, they just float through the postsynaptic membrane and then they cross the, post, the, the synaptic space and then they exert their influence on presynaptic uh, receptors. So they're basically reverse inhibitory or their retrograde signaling messengers which have basically an inhibitory function. So really what they do is they inhibit the presynaptic release of uh, neurotransmitters including acetylcholine, dopamine, GABA, glutamate, serotonin, norepinephrine and the endorphins. And that's how they work. So they basically get made postsynaptically they then diffuse across the postsynaptic membrane into the space and then they inhibit presynaptic release of neurotransmitters. Fantastic. That's, that's what they do. And, no, it's, sorry, go on. And I guess 
to kind of carry on this conversation, um, can you talk to us a bit about the production versus the degradation of these of these ligands? How, yeah. how does how does that work? Yeah. So we've we've mentioned before that they are synthesized on demand, and so they're synthesized on demand from membrane lipid precursors. So anandamide is derived from the membrane precursor NAPE, N-A-P-E, which stands for, and I'm going to read this, N-arachidonyl phosphatidyl ethanol amine. And there are a number of pathways that are involved in this, but basically phospholipase A2, phospholipase C, and phospholipase D are involved in the synthesis of anandamide from NAPE. And then the degradation of uh, Anandamide is mediated by an enzyme called, uh, it's a postsynaptic enzyme called fatty acid amino hydroxylase, FAAH. So we have the phospholipases, A2, C, and D, producing anandamide from NAPE, and then we have the uh, hydrolase enzyme, FAAH, degrading it. So literally it is formed on demand and then it is de degraded on demand as well. So it's, 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 it's concentration is tightly regulated by those two, by the interaction of those two enzyme systems. Now then, if we move on to 2-AG, glycerol, it's synthesized from DAG, diacylglycerol, by diacylglycerol lipase, and is degraded presynaptically. presynaptically. Now remember, anandamide's degradation was postsynaptic, but... Uh, arachidonyl glycerol is degraded presynaptically by MAG, MAG, so monoacylglycerol lipase. So again, there is a synthesis and there is a degradation and it's closely interregulated. And I guess this is good um, knowledge to, to have as, as a baseline to, when we think about cannabis because a lot of us think of, of cannabis or marijuana as, as one substance when really cannabis is really, um, we, what we consider cannabis is really delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the psychoactive component of, of cannabis. But the actual cannabis plant has so many different phytocannabinoids in it or, or cannabinoids, and they all act differently and they all act differently on, on the receptor. So it's actually quite a unique and interesting plant, and it's not really uniform what each of the cannabinoids will, will do. Isn't that right, Fergal? Yeah, yeah. So there's a huge variety of phytocannabinoids uh, within the cannabis plant, and they all have subtly different actions, and they all have uh, um, different concentrations in the plant as well. And actually, we don't necessarily know exactly what it is in which particular phytocannabinoid has the best effect in terms of therapeutic interventions. We are simply assuming that it's the THC or CBD, and we've, got, we've done a lot of work on that, but... Really, who knows? You know, we still haven't yet discovered all of the potential phytochemicals or phytocannabinoids. It's a, it's an it's a very much an evolving science. Absolutely, and I guess just to close out this introductory episode on, on cannabis, we might just talk briefly, Fergal, on the two um, commonest known uh, cannabinoids, which is delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol. And can you explain yeah. to, to us the effects that um, these two cannabinoids have on the uh, CB1 and CB2 receptor? Yeah, so let's go back to the endocannabinoid system first. And let's remember that anandamide is a partial agonist of CB1, CB2, and 2-AG is a full agonist at CB1, CB2, right? Now compare that with the extrinsic uh, phytocannabinoids in THC. So THC is a partial agonist of CB1, CB2. And CBD does not actually work on the CB1, CB2 receptors. It doesn't have any functional activity there, which makes some people argue, well, why do we even classify it as a, as a cannabinoid? And I suppose the nomenclature is confusion, confusing because cannabinoid, I suppose, really means anything derived from the cannabis plant. And then we've extended that definition to include the endocannabinoid system. Now, so let's go to THC. So it's really important to emphasize that, that natural THC is a partial agonist of CB1, CB2. 
These new psychotropic novel cannabinoids are particularly toxic because they are designed to be full agonists of the CB1 receptor, or in some cases, the CB2. So that's why they are so toxic. They're a lot more harmful than the naturally occurring THC. So we know that THC has a number of uh, actions. Uh, I'll just go briefly into them, but basically they, they have uh, eff effects with pain, spasticity, sedation, appetite, mood. We know that THC is a bronchodilator. We know it's got a neuroprotective antioxidant effect. We know it's an antipruritic agent in cholestatic jaundice, and we know it's got an anti-inflammatory effect. So it's got a wide range of effects, most of which are related to its effect on neuromodulation. This goes back to, you know, THC activates as a partial agonist CB1 in the neuro, neuro, uh, the neurological system. And we know it's a CB2 partial agonist, which is an anti-inflammatory. So remember, that's why THC has those effects, because it activates the CB1, CB2 receptor. Now, CBD doesn't actually really, uh, doesn't work as an agonist on CBD recept on, on uh, CB1, CB2 receptors. So there's this phrase that it lacks detectable psychoactivity. But it does have clinical effects, and it may actually act as a non-competitive allosteric modulator of CB1 receptors. So it may actually uh, inhibit the function of CB1 receptors. But it does have other effects. So we know that it is a scavenger. It is an antioxidant. So it scavenges a reactive oxygen species. We also know that it's a positive allosteric modulator of glycine receptors. And from, from your old pharmacology days, you will remember that glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it, it, it modifies and potentiates the inhibitory effect of glycine. And finally, I think one of the most interesting functions of uh, CBD is the fact that it is an enzyme inhibitor. It inhibits the action of FAAH. And I hear you all say, well, what is FAAH? Well, remember we said that FAAH is the enzyme primarily responsible for the degradation of anandamide. So FAAH degrades anandamide, and if you inhibit the action of FAAH, then you actually increase the amount of endogenous anandamide available for function. So it potentiates the effect of anandamide within the endocannabinoid system. So we've talked about the functions of CBD, we've talked about the functions of THC, we've talked about the endocannabinoid system. Would you care to summarize some of the key learning points in this episode then. Absolutely, Fergal. And we've had another information-packed episode of Cracking Addiction today. So briefly in the time that we've uh, been speaking, we've talked about the endocannabinoid system. We've talked about the predominant CB1 and CB2 receptors. We have talked about the location of these receptors and the effects they have on the body. We have detailed the vast multitude of cannabinoids there are within the cannabis plant. And we have briefly summarized and touched on um, uh, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabidiol and their effects on different uh, receptors within the endocannabinoid system and their effects. So it's been yet another action-packed episode of Cracking Addiction. Thanks for your attention and bye for now.